What do you think about the legal system that we have in America today? The system is skewed in favor of the prosecution. Even people that are innocent can unfortunately get convicted. The next morning was Sunday morning and you know, the phone starts to ring. The words were, Brent is not breathing and he's turning blue. A day that I'll never forget. One of the things I love doing is interviewing interesting characters who have an incredible background and an experience with business. And that's exactly who we're sitting with here today. Robert Shapiro, who was the dream team leading the defense attorney for O.J. Simpson, also the co-founder of LegalZoom, as well as Right Counsel. He transitioned from what he was doing there to also working with civil litigation right now. So with that being said, thank you so much for making the time and opening your office to us. You're, wel you're welcome, and really? thanks, thanks for being here. I love your YouTube channel. Great to be here with you. So obviously LA, I lived here for 25 years. I'm now in Dallas, and every time I come back here, there's an affinity to the city I got. Growing up, seeing you, I was telling you earlier, I said, you know, there's a lot of attorneys out there that you'll see on TV, and a lot of them that have different approaches they take. And I don't know what it is, every time I see you, I watch any of your content, I've seen you on TV, you read about you, you're so consistent in a class act. I just wanna make sure I give you that props because I know sometimes you don't hear that with attorneys. You, well, that's you, the reason you, you're here because yeah, I knew you were gonna say nice things yeah, about Yeah, that, that, that's the one thing about you, so. But let's get right into it. Prior to you becoming who you are today, you've represented a lot of different characters. You know, Paul and I are big on baseball. He's a KC guy. He was talking about Vince Coleman, Conseco, whether we know OJ, obviously, Strawberry. Strawberry. That's right, Strawberry. Your list of people you represent, even Rob Kardashian recently, there's a list of a lot of people that you work with. But take me back to what I want to know about is, if I'm in high school with Robert Shapiro, who was Robert Shapiro in high school? I was this very, very small, undersized kid, had a good memory, but didn't really study hard, was not really athletic. When I entered high school, I wasn't five feet tall. I had struggles in high school on a social level because of my size and my lack of maturity. From a middle-class working family, my father drove a lunch truck, uh, my mother was a sales lady in a clothing store. Had a, a nice family existence, only child, did fairly well and was able to uh, get accepted to UCLA directly out of high school and uh, spent the next five years of my life there because I liked it so much. UCLA. Loved so you it. stayed a little, little, little longer than usual? I, I, just... I took the long-term program. Now, were you having fun? Were you, were you a guy that I'd have fun with if I was in college with you or were you so focused on classroom and reading your books and all that stuff? No. I, see, I see a fun humor side of you as well. Well, there was a, an organization at UCLA uh, called the Kelps, and it was really a fraternity within a fraternity. So every fraternity would put up a certain number of people, and it was primarily made up of athletes. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was, was a Kelp when I was there. A lot of uh, the football players, and it was a spirit organization, but the spirit had no limits. So we, we pretty much, <laughs> we, we, we pretty much uh, exceeded expectations of having fun. I like that. I mean, answering it like an attorney, the spirit had no limits. You know, you got to read into it. That's great. For me, my spirit had no limits in the army. I wanted to make sure I contributed to society when I was in the army. There were a lot of uh, fathers that loved us when we lived in Kentucky. So. so I was in the ROTC. Oh, really? Yeah. It was mandatory at UCLA. Okay. Uh, I, went in, I entered UCLA in 1960. The draft board was right across the street on Westwood Boulevard, and it was mandatory for two years of ROTC. If you decided to stay four years, you immediately went in as a second lieutenant. If you did two years, then you were eligible for the draft, and I was 1A fit and ready to go. When I was at UCLA, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I never thought about being a lawyer. I never knew what lawyers did. And it was only upon graduation when the war in Vietnam was raging and there were a couple of ways not to go into the service. Uh, one was to burn your draft card and become a conscientious objector, which I wouldn't do. Two was to move to Canada. Or three was to go to graduate school. And I was a finance major at UCLA and they didn't have any graduate business school at that time. So myself and a few of my fraternity brothers who were in the same position said, you know what, why don't we apply to law school? We sent out applications virtually for any 
flute, to anything that was below a first rate law school because we hadn't done any education, we hadn't prepared for testing, etc. And the three of us got accepted to uh, the University of San Diego Law School. Hmm. And we went down to San Diego, uh, enrolled, and the first day of class, I get a call from Loyola where I had been waitlisted that one seat opened in the night school. I said, guys, you know, Loyola's a lot closer. I don't have to live away from home. They were a little bit pissed off, yeah. to say the least. I went up to Loyola to start at four years in night school. I get to Loyola and lo and behold, the last guy in the day school drops out and one seat opens up in the day school. And they asked me if I want to take that. Turned out to be the beginning of my law school career, something I never never thought about. Something you never saw in high school. You weren't somebody who said, I'm gonna grow up and be a lawyer. That wasn't you. My mother wanted me to be a dentist. That's why I spent five years at UCLA. My first year was as a pre-dental major. And, and I was doing okay God. until I met physics and chemistry with these geniuses uh, that were at UCLA. So, But I, I was able to struggle my way through those classes. What I didn't know is they give you a piece of chalk and an X-Acto knife, and they say, cut a tooth. No preparation. I'm not really good with my hands other than when I box. Every time I did it, I broke the chalk. So my first year, I had to you drop knew. out a pre-dental program and get into the finance Interesting. School. So now your, your other friends who went to UC, uh, UC San Diego, you said, and they went to law, how did they end up doing in their careers? Did you end up staying in law? You know, one ended up being uh, an assistant to the commissioner of baseball, Rich Levin, who was a lifelong friend, and the other uh, became a lawyer and still practices. Still practices. So all three of you went to the top. All three of you did well for yourselves. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. When you were a kid, were you one that would debate all the time? Were you one that would always argue because you're, you're the only child? Were you argue with your mom or your dad? Was there some of that in you or not really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a gift for Gab. You did. Yeah, I could talk my way out of most things and into a few things. <laughs> so you knew you could go this route and do something with this gift that was given to you. Yeah. So now, you are now a lawyer, you're coming up. How was it and what was the first breakthrough you had? Upon graduating law school, I said, you know what, I'm gonna give it a shot being a lawyer. One thing that happened in law school was we had moot court competition. I was fortunate to win the oral argument in, in moot court. I got the highest grade in the school and became the chief justice of the moot court and got to meet judges that uh, would be judging the next competition. And so they said, you know, you, you really should go into trial law. And at that time, I thought I need to get some experience. So I had a choice of becoming a deputy district attorney, a public defender, or city council. City council lawyers rarely, if ever, got to court. The public defenders had long hair and were on the very liberal side. And I was on the liberal side, but my hair was short. And then I said, you know, if I'm a public defender, I'm going to be going up against DAs who know as little as I know. But as a DA, I'm going to get exposed to other lawyers who are in private practice. And that's what I did for about 18 months. Then went into private practice and I got the first publicized case in America when I was out of the DA's office for about six months. I got a call from somebody I didn't know who identified themselves as Liza Minnelli and said, uh, I was told to call you because David Winters, a choreographer who I knew uh, because our sons went to the same preschool and Linda Lovelace just got arrested in Las Vegas for possession for sale of cocaine. Went to the airport, rented a plane, flew to Las Vegas and ended up representing Linda Lovelace on the first nationally publicized case in America. How was that adjustment for you? From being not in the limelight to all of a sudden everybody's... It just gets a momentum of its own. You don't plan on it and, and all of a sudden it's uh, Linda Lovelace the first legitimate porn star prior to Stormy Daniels, that uh, people knew her name, actually showed her movie Deep Throat in, in theaters where people would go on dates. She inspired a lot of men. Yeah. You know, she, was, she was an inspiration to a lot. She had God-given talents. I get national publicity, and now it's, it's the 70s, and it's drug, sex, and rock and roll, and I seem to be getting calls from lots of people in the music business 
who are getting arrested for drugs mm -hmm. and develop the niche for representing people in high profile cases. So let me ask you, as a good friend of mine, Rick, he was a criminal defense attorney in the 80s for 20 years and he was doing very, very good for himself here locally in LA. And then he started kind of getting a little bit too deep into it, where he ended up picking up the bad habits of the people he was representing. And then obviously lost his license, went to prison for 20 years, and you know, God bless his soul, he passed away six months ago. Just a sweetheart of a guy. He, he could tell stories all day. Honestly, if he sat here and told stories, the guy was nonstop for two, three full days. How did you yourself, while you're representing and while you're in this world, how did none of that like get to you where you're like, this is just purely business, none of this association is going to rub off on me? Well, I've always viewed being a lawyer as something that uh, was a profession. And uh, I always separated personal life from my professional life. I, I never socialized with clients and uh, was always anti-drug, even though I was representing people in the 70s, primarily for possession of drugs. I mean, marijuana in the 70s was a felony. And today it's legal in some form in 29 states or in, in this country. I never got to the point where I got seduced by anyone in the drug business or uh, people that were using drugs and, and was then and still am uh, very anti-drug. That's one of the reasons why you started your foundation, which is something you yes. can talk about later on. Going back to your career are you, as you were coming up from seeing it from your standpoint, Robert, what is different between the legal world you were in then versus what it is today? What dynamics has dramatically changed in the last 40, 50 years with social media? One word, the internet. I wrote an article about 20 years ago. It was called uh, How to Deal with the Press. I gave a speech only to lawyers and they said, you know, that, that was a great article. Can we have a copy of the speech? And I don't write anything out. So I said, no, it was, you know, done extemporaneously. And they said, well, why don't you try to put it on paper? So, so I did and became one of the 10 best articles of the decade from the uh, legal journal. Then the news was on a daily basis, not on a second by second basis. So there were ways you can get messages across the way you would like. Got it. You could have more time to be intentional versus today it's more spontaneous is it, it's instantaneous wow instantaneous and so that's why you can catch people at an off moment saying things that they hadn't thought about uh, making statements that they regret they made uh, that they have to claw back on but then you know i mean if a reporter would call i said you know give me a few minutes i'll get back to you Get your, thoughts to get your thoughts together. And By the way, is that article still available? Is it still public? Can, can it still be found? I think it can, yeah. yeah. Has opportunities for the law as an industry. Obviously, you, you were also co-founder of Right Counsel uh, uh, and uh, LegalZoom. Is the business and amount of opportunities for lawyers to go into business higher today than it was 40, 50 years ago? Or oh, yeah. I, no, I think it's much, it's much higher. I mean, okay. today, today, anybody can put a website up. doesn't matter what their office looks like. It doesn't matter about anything. They can put up the most gorgeous website and have walked out of law school yesterday. I think about today when you're saying that, you know, it makes you think people are getting caught with mistakes more today than they did before, which means there's more of a need to have somebody represent them today than 30, 40, 50 years ago. And, and you know, what, what you said is, is one of the reasons we started both of the companies, LegalZoom in 2000, which is now 18 years to make legal documentation available to virtually everyone at an affordable price. And more recently, right counsel, because today any person can put up a fancy website and people don't know where to find lawyers, especially if they've been injured. If they've been injured either in an auto accident, if the insurance companies haven't treated them fairly, if uh, they've been unfortunately affected by bad drugs, if they've been injured in the workplace, if they've been discriminated against, any kind of case that a lawyer would take on a contingency. Mm -hmm. That is, they'll get their fee at the end uh, of the case as part of the recovery. But people don't know who these lawyers are. So they'll just type in a keyword, uh, accident lawyer, and up will pop a bunch of very fancy websites uh, of lawyers who you may know nothing about. And so people would ask me, even in my own law firm, a friend of ours was in an accident who, who's a good lawyer. 
before this, or we had a, a wrongful death, we had a horrible uh, injury. Through the years of practice, I've gotten to know lawyers across the country. And so rather than having a service where people are actually buying territories, you have this 1-800 dentist, for example. Well, people will come in and say, I'll pay so much to get referrals in Los Angeles, so much in Orange County. Lawyers do the same thing. We said, you know, you're not getting the best lawyers. You're just getting somebody who is paying to get a referral. What if we did this with no charge to people? If they called and used our expertise and our background and people that we're working with and put them in touch with the best lawyer at no cost to them. And then we would try to put together the right lawyer with the right person for the right case. Almost like a matchmaker. Exactly Got it. Right. So that's exactly. Right Counsel. Exactly, and that's RightCounsel.com. So RightCounsel.com is a matchmaker between the client and the lawyer. How do I, as a lawyer, get filtered to make it on Right Counsel? You would not qualify. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell immediately. <laughs> but, but how does somebody, uh, okay. as a lawyer, so, qualify so, to be on Right Counsel? Okay, so for, first of all, it's people I've known throughout the years. Lawyers that I've worked with, lawyers that I've seen in court, lawyers that have distinguished themselves by getting special recognition, being the tops in their field, are people that are coming to us are getting the best representation. Got it. How many total lawyers on right counsel? Well, we don't have any lawyers on right counsel. Every case is individually So they analyzed. come through venue matchmaker. Exactly so I'm right. not going to really know who it is. You're going to direct me. Do you give a few options? You say, here's this, here's this, here's no, this, we, or is it we, typically one? We, we try to do this. We probably try to say, you know, you've filed the claim for insurance. You've had tremendous flood damage in your house, and you think it's going to cost you $200,000 to fix. And the insurance company says, no, we think it's $20,000. Well, you can either give in to the insurance or try to find a lawyer who will say they're acting in bad faith. I'm sure all the people here would have no idea where to find a lawyer that deals with bad faith. I happen to know the top lawyer in the country Got it. that deals with bad faith cases. Boom. Right, counsel? You connect me with them. Exactly. Right. And then on LegalZoom, which we're a customer, by the way, we've used LegalZoom, God knows for how many years. Phenomenal site, easy to use. All of it's pretty simple to find the documentation there. So LegalZoom was inspired for reasoning to find what? To do the basic stuff? Obviously, we know right, counsel. How about LegalZoom? Okay, so, so LegalZoom started out with a simple, simple premise that people needed important documentation. Basically, wills. Everybody should have a will and should at least have a living will, durable power of attorney if God forbid something happens to you and you get ill. And it started with this concept that we had four founders, Brian Liu, Brian Lee, and Eddie Hartman, and myself, each had different roles in, in putting this business together. And we were hoping to do 40 wills a month and break even. <laughs> and today it's the biggest company in the world uh, doing legal documentation. Biggest company in the world doing legal documentation. So how many wills do you do per month now to break even? It, it, wills is not the biggest thing that we do. Primarily it's in corporations. Okay. Uh, we do more corporations than everybody else combined in California. Even though you're nationwide though. In California you have to be In California. Legal. Okay. But LegalZoom is na it's, na it's nationwide. 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 Yes. So, so let me ask you, I've hired a lot of attorneys, I've fired a lot of attorneys. As somebody that runs a business himself, we've had some incredible attorneys. Cooley Law Firm, we work with a lot of guys here locally, we have some in New York, we have some in San Fran, but when you get a good one, you gotta keep it, because it's tough to find a good one. Good I, lawyer, good doctor, two uh, things that you should always them. have. Keep them, keep them for a long time, right? The question becomes, I've also had some bad experiences with attorneys when I was early on coming up, so I didn't know how to decipher between the two and hold them accountable, right? And th that can be pretty costly for a lot of people. How does a client who is running a business, you're running a budget, say you don't have a lot of money, you only have a few hundred thousand dollars and you're trying to get this business going, and every $10,000 counts, every $5,000 counts, every single penny you put counts to make your business last. How does a client hold an attorney accountable so when you get the statement that says, this really took me 42 hours at $380 an hour, you owe me this much, versus 
He had his other guys doing the legwork assistant who are $120, you know, $75 an hour. How do you hold them accountable with the math? It's a question, it's, it's something a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. And with good reason. Sure. Because the law practice is really a law business. From a business model, talking to entrepreneurs, perhaps the worst business model anybody could come up with. Only lawyers could think of a business model like this. <laughs> Number one, most lawyers work on an hourly basis. Only so many hours in a day, only so many hours in a year mm -hmm. that you can bill for. Number two, there is no passive income. You have to continually put in hours to bill people. Tremendous overhead, tremendous back support needed. Hours are incredibly long because judges require documentation almost instantaneously overnight to be filed. But then the worst part of the practice of law is you could build up the best law firm in the world and at the end of the day you can't sell it it has no capital value whatsoever the only time a law practice has some value is when you get a divorce and the goodwill is put to the other side but other than that there's no passive income and there's no residual income. So having said that, and no how do capitalization. I, and I hear that a lot. So that's why on the other side, but there's also a lot of money to be made on the front end, right? There's a lot of money to be made if you do it right, you get in the right market. But how do you hold the attorney accountable? How does the entrepreneur, the CEO hold? So for instance, have you ever had anybody represent you? Have you had lawyers represent you? Yes. So how do you hold them accountable to make sure they don't charge you 50% more than they typically would? You're in the world, so teach us as an expert. How do you hold the uh, attorneys accountable? All right, so the first lesson that I learned, and I actually learned this from uh, the general counsel at Wynn, where I was just involved in a, in a very significant case for the last five years. And she said, I hire lawyers, I don't hire law firms. So any lawyer that was gonna work on the case had to be interviewed by the general counsel to see whether or not this was a lawyer they wanted. Number two, they don't pay to train lawyers, so if you have a first, second, or third year lawyer that you're giving an assignment to, that lawyer is learning on the job, and the client is paying for it. I'd recommend to entrepreneurs, number one, make sure you're hiring a lawyer, not a law firm. Number two, that the person that's going to work with them has experience, is not there to learn on the job. And number three, don't spend a lot of time talking on the phone because lawyers bill by the so minute. So good at it though. Don't talk on the phone. Hold, hold it until you really know. I see a lot of people laughing. Long but, sentences. But, Attorneys know how to have run on sentences for 18 minutes. <laughs> and 18 minutes gets you past the first 15. That's right. So now you're paying for 30. That's right. Oh, believe me, I put the phone there and I watch it. I say, I know what he's doing. I said, okay, I gotta go. So for me, it's okay, I gotta go or else we're gonna get that bill and I make the note. So hire lawyers not law firm. Two, if you are going to hire the lawyer, don't hire a lawyer that's going to be a $200 an hour. I think this is what I'm taking from what you're saying. Be willing to pay the 450 right. because he's not going to just come and try to learn on you. He's already had it before and with 10 plus years of experience, exactly. pay 2x the price. Well, you know, at Glazer Weil, our, our law firm here that I've been a partner for 30 years, we don't hire uh, lawyers to train. We don't have first, second, or third year lawyers here. All our lawyers are lateral transfers who have proven themselves at other firms and want, and want to come to a place where there's a great atmosphere, great camaraderie, and great legal services available. I like that. So what makes a great lawyer, by the way? I mean, being in the world that you're in, you watch everybody, right? You know, Do you see somebody it, and you say, this guy has it or that girl has it or? The lawyers that people know are the trial lawyers, mm -hmm. are, are the attorneys that are in court and the ones that you see. To be a great lawyer, uh, as a trial lawyer, number one, you have to be able to be very quick on your feet. You have to be able to analyze things quickly, and you have to be able to present things to a jury of 12 people who may know nothing about the law in an understandable way. I I'll give you an example. Years ago, there was a major lawsuit here by the NFL against the Raiders, who were at the Coliseum. This lawsuit uh, was whether or not the Raiders could move from Oakland to, to Los Angeles, 
even though there was some controversy with the NFL. And I knew uh, Pete Rosell and I knew one of the owners, Gene Klein, who was the owner of the Chargers, was a, was a good family friend. And so they asked if I would come watch part of the trial. And so I went to the opening statements. And there, there were two different styles. One was a lawyer from a major law firm who got up and gave the greatest treatise on monopolies and lack of competition that you could ever hear. And he had behind him about 15 other lawyers, and in those days there were file boxes, not computers, in the courtroom. He was stunningly brilliant. Then a guy uh, named Joe Aliotto, lawyer from San Francisco, got up. He didn't have anybody sitting next to him other than Max Bleacher, another lawyer who was representing the Coliseum. He was representing Al Davis. And they got up with no notes, and there was six uh, people sitting in the jury box. And they just started talking to him about the way the NFL was manipulating and, and taking advantage of these small people. We had lunch, and lawyers were sitting around, and the team owners that were with the NFL they were talking about how brilliant their lawyer was and the other lawyers didn't even know anything about antitrust and about monopolies. And I said, you know what? They knew one thing that you guys don't. They knew how to talk to those jurors. Those jurors were listening. Your lawyer was great if he was teaching a class in antitrust at Harvard Law School. Six people sitting there after five minutes had no idea what he was talking about. Wow. And Al Davis won. Wow. That's what makes a great lawyer. You see it also style-wise. You see some is very in-your-face. You're not an in-your-face type of a, no. an attorney. You think the fact that your pacing is slower than the most gives you an edge? Because the way you, know. the I same mean, sentence a person can say in two seconds, I think you say it in four seconds. And I think that gives you an additional two seconds to think about an answer and maybe allows you to think a little bit more of a better answer. You think there's an edge for you? I see it from an outside as an edge for you. You know, I picked up lessons in life. One of the people that I got to know during the practice was Jack Nicholson. And he said something to me that has stuck with me throughout my career. Speak low and speak slow. I took that advice to heart. Are you a big movie guy? Did you, do you watch a lot of movies about law and all this stuff? Or you don't, you don't really go out there you know, and speak too much? You know, I hate movies about law. Really? I re and the really? reason is because they're legal fiction. I mean, there's some... 12 Angry Men uh, stands out as a realistic movie, but the rest of them are, are, are legal fantasies, legal fiction. It's nothing that takes place in the courtroom. You don't have uh, lawyers running up to the bench and yelling at a judge or going back in chambers alone. I mean, and so those kind of things frustrate me, and that's really one of the reasons I have always advocated uh, cameras in the courtroom, so the public can really see what lawyers do. How it's done. Yeah. So have you watched Primal Fear? No. There's a part of it where I think you said in a Megyn Kelly interview, you said there's a, and by the way, the fact that since the O.J. Simpson case you've done, you did two interviews, you said right off the bat, and you said you did one just recently with Megyn Kelly 20 years later. So we're not going that side because you've consistently said, I'm not commenting on the case, and you have been like that for all this time, three interviews, two right after, one recent with Megyn Kelly. But I thought it was interesting when you said, when it comes down to it, there is moral justice, there is legal justice, right? So you see a lot in the movie Primal Fear, you see Edward Norton, the character, comes out and Richard Gere is just doing his job and all of a sudden he's like, oh my gosh, I was representing you. Did you ever have an instance yourself where you were thinking, how do I set aside my emotions when rep you've represented God knows how many people over the years? Were you ever in a position yourself where you were sitting there saying, I really don't like the guy I'm representing, but you know what, I'll get the job done. Were you ever in that position? Lots of times. Lots of times. Especially as a young lawyer when I relied on court appointments. There were conflicts with the public defender's office and, and judges would, would ask you to represent somebody. I recall representing one of the people uh, that was in the Aryan Brotherhood, sitting next to me with a swastika on his neck. You know, I had to put aside the hatred I had for seeing that symbol and focus on the facts of the case, and he was acquitted. Wow, that tells me you're very emotionally tough and you're very mentally tough. What is your formula to keep yourself mentally and emotionally tough in situations like that, to still go out there and do the job? I'll give you an example, and I used this example shortly after a controversial verdict. 
I was in the hallways leaving my doctor's office and a doctor came up to me with a name that was uh, obviously a Jewish surname. And he said, how could you ever represent somebody like that that you knew was guilty? And I said, doctor, let me ask you something. Have you ever worked in an emergency room? He said, yeah, I mean, that's part of our training, we do that. I said, well, I want to give you an example. Let's say uh, you're on duty in an emergency room and the cops come in with a guy on a gurney. And the cops are saying, you know, we caught this guy in the act of molesting a child. And he tried to get away. We had to do a pursuit. He wouldn't stop, so we had to shoot him. And unfortunately, we didn't kill him. But this is really a bad guy, doctor. And the guy is coming in now on a gurney, and it's a code blue, and you're called to attend to him. And so you have to do an emergency tracheotomy, open up his shirt. And I use this example because it happened to me. And you see a, a swastika on his neck. What are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to call another doctor. He said, well, let's say it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're the only doctor there. What are you going to do? He said, well, I'm obviously going to have to do my best to save his life. There's the answer to your question. I'm not a judge. I'm not a juror. Most cases are not cases of who did it. Most cases are cases of something did take place. Who is responsible? And if they are responsible, what is it? So, for example, you could take a, a set of facts where two people are in an argument, one person takes a baseball bat, hits the other person and kills them. Well, you would say, that's got to be murder. If you weren't there, perhaps there was an argument before and the other guy had the baseball bat and was disarmed and this guy hit him. Or fell down and fell on the baseball bat where it could be an accident. So you could have anything from not guilty to involuntary manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, or second degree murder. We know a crime took place. We don't know what it was. Do you want to know? Do you want to know? I always want to know. I want to know. Every, I don't want to drive down the road. Really? I don't want to drive down the road and somebody says, you know, just go straight. You're not going to have any issues. And if I hit a bump in the road and I don't know about it, I'm going to be taken off guard. So I, I want to know the facts. I want to know the true facts and not make any judgment on them. So first step is tell me everything. Is that what the first step is with you before you take them up as a client? Is that the, is that the process? No, no. You have to really sit down. You have to get confidence with somebody. And, and then once you start getting into uh, the facts, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case. So is the process accept first, then information, or it's give me the info? Let's sign that I'm not going to disclose anything and an acceptance. What's the process in the world you're in? The way I do it, if somebody comes in, I want to hear them. I want to listen to the, them about their case. I want to tell them whether or not I'm comfortable with this type of case, whether it's something that I have the time to do and, and want to do, especially now with civil matters. And then once we get into the preparation, I make it very clear that, you know, everything you tell me is privileged. I will not share it with anyone without your permission. And I want to know exactly what took place. It's not going to affect the way I represent you. However, I will not let you take the stand and lie or misrepresent. Maybe we won't have you testify, but I need to know all the facts. That's the approach you take. Okay, so when you are getting that information, how are you processing the information to say, okay, create a baseball bat. He hit him. No, maybe the other guy hit him, the other guy grabbed him and hit him. Maybe he fell down and he hit the head on the baseball bat, right? So is there a part where you say, these are the facts, if I go this route, we're going to lose if we go this route, but I'm going to go this route because I know this is going to be the argument that's going to be beneficial to this case. Is that what the creative, you know, no, representation I, you know, comes? You know, look, at the stuff I'm doing now and the stuff I've been doing for years are, are serious major things, especially on the civil side. And it's really an intelligent fact-gathering method of getting a tremendous amount of information, being able to put it together in a way that you can present it to a trier of fact that's understandable and advocate uh, your client's position the best you can. What do you think about the legal system that we have in, in America today with how it's set up, with the fact that we have the percentage that we have in prison 
and some that probably don't belong in there and some that do belong that are not in there. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so we've got two parts. We've got a civil system and a criminal system. So you're talking now about the, the criminal system. First of all, it depends where you are in the country. In some parts of the country, it's relatively sophisticated. Uh, in the federal courts, it's more sophisticated than the state courts. Uh, and in some areas, it's more sophisticated than in others. The system is skewed in favor of the prosecution. There's just no question about it. The judges are generally former prosecutors. Police are generally believed more than uh, private citizens. And the overwhelming majority of people that get involved in the criminal system end up working out a settlement, a plea bargain. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the risk of going to trial in serious cases is overwhelming. Even people that are innocent can unfortunately get convicted. Can. Can. And have. Sure. I mean, we have, Plenty. We've had historically innocent people executed, which is the worst thing that could ever happen. And so we've developed a system that cases get evaluated uh, by prosecutors and defense lawyers and judges and get settled because people cannot take the risk when they're facing 20 years if, if they can settle a case for probation and house arrest. And so you have a tremendous amount of people that, if they went to trial, may quite often be successful, but they can't take the risk because the exposure is unknown. So does it need to be changed systematically or socially? Like, do we need to start talking about it more to minimize it, or systematically some changes need to take place for that percentage to go lower? You know, the, the problem is this, is that financial resources limit the ability in criminal cases. Judges are simply overwhelmed with calendars. Federal judges have one calendar themselves. They may have three, four hundred cases a year on a calendar. State court judges are, are hearing on criminal matters 10 or 15 cases a day until they get to a point where uh, they're, they're sitting there with high profile trials. The system is just too big to fit the individual needs, which is very unfortunate. And so people fall into categories. So you think it's gonna continue the way it is right now? They're, they're... Yeah, I think it is. First of all, we have too many laws on the books. I think we have to start focusing more on, on things that are really important uh, to society and to individuals and try to minimize the smaller cases and, and find ways to take them outside of the court system, which we're doing. There's a lot of diversion programs for first-time offenders on drug cases especially. And there's been tremendous advancements in not incarcerating people who uh, have a drug disease. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So why don't we transition to that? You know, I read up on, I was also speaking to your assistant now, and she was talking about your passion for the Brent Shapiro Foundation, the story, I didn't want to say the story, I wanted you to say the story on why it's Brent Shapiro. So uh, in 2005, my wife and I lost our son to the disease of alcohol and drugs. Uh, Brent was 25 years old. We had discovered that he had uh, a drug addiction probably from the age of 17 or 18, but we didn't discover it early enough. I had some suspicions uh, about it. My wife thought it was part of growing up and experimentation. And so there, there was some, some conflict within the family. But then it got to the point where it was very, very obvious that, uh, that he was in trouble and needed help. Fortunately, he was a bright kid, so he was able to cover it up. And, and you learn through experience that people who have this, this uh, addiction, and which I am convinced is a disease, uh, are incapable of telling the truth. So the mother may accept uh, statements that uh, would seem incredulous to most people. Drug addicts uh, have, have a way of uh, being very cunning and being able to convince you that they are not addicted to drugs and, and that 
there's no real problems. And then you get to the point where, where you know that there's a problem and your friends and their friends start telling you. And so then you start the process of rehabilitation. A real problem in this country. Number one, there are no standards for rehabilitation. Two, nobody has ever come up with any proven way to treat this disease. It's all based on, oh, we have great results here uh, out in Malibu and we have great results in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's just not true. So there are very few people who have the expertise uh, of how to deal with mental diseases in, in general and drug disease in particular. And that was the experience we had with Brent. He went to uh, a 30-day program and like most people on a 30-day program, on the 31st day they relapse. I could put him, a drug addict in my home, lock him up for 30 days, uh, feed him and talk to him, and they're not gonna use drugs for 30 days. And the next day they leave, they, they will definitely relapse. There's just no question about it. Then you go back and then you try to go to sober living. Unless somebody's in a program for a year or more, uh, there's really virtually no chance. And Brent, fortunately, at the end, got into a year-long program in Virginia, got sober, went to SC, was on the dean's list, uh, was ready to graduate, go to law school, and he relapsed. He took a half of ecstasy and two shots of Jagermeister, according to everybody who was at a back-to-school party, not a wild, crazy party, something at the Elks Club in Hollywood. And he got sick. He got really sick and started to projectile vomit. And nobody wanted to call the paramedics for a very simple reason. They didn't want us to know that he had relapsed. He was engaged, the wedding would be off, he'd have to go back into rehab. So they said, just let him sleep it off. And uh, he went home with his fiance and the next morning was Sunday morning and a day that I'll never forget. That, you know, the phone starts to ring and it's a little too early and it seems to be ringing a little bit too long. And uh, the words were, Brent is not breathing and he's turning blue. Did you call the paramedics? Yes, just before I called you. Where are you? We're in West Hollywood. I wake up my wife, Linnell. We get in the car and go to Cedar sinai And we got there before the paramedics arrived. I knew that wasn't a good sign. And the news wasn't good. He wasn't breathing and he was in a coma. Doctors worked with him and uh, the next day conclusively told us that uh, he was not going to recover. And so we had to make that decision that parents never want to make and, uh, and let him go. We had a memorial, 2,000 people came, a lot of our friends and a lot of his friends, very popular, very social kid. And one of my friends who has since unfortunately passed away, Michael King came to me and said, you know, I'm so moved by what took place because at the memorial we only talked about drugs and addiction. We dealt with it head on. And the only people who spoke were his friends who were also drug addicts. And his counselor and myself. And he said, I want to make a donation in your son's name to your favorite charity. And I said, you know, I don't know that I have a favorite charity, but I want to start one for drug and alcohol awareness. And he wrote me a substantial check. Within uh, eight weeks, we had a public charity called the Brent Shapiro Foundation for Drug and Alcohol Awareness. From 2005 to about 2011, we went around the country, we published two children's books, one called Somo Says No for five-year-old kids, how to introduce drugs wow. with parents at an early, early age. 
and then followed up by a book called David's Discovery, uh, 12 year olds, all available free to any school or any group that, that wants them through us. We developed something called the Save a Life card. It's just a very simple message and it tells you what the symptoms are. People are reluctant to call 911 for a couple reasons. Number one, they think they're going to get in trouble if they have drugs. So we were trying to push along the uh, Good Samaritan Law, which Governor Brown signed four years ago, that nobody can get arrested if they have drugs themselves, bringing somebody to a hospital with drugs. And we, we've sent those out by the hundreds of thousands. They're also on our website, brentshapiro.org. And then, you know, around 2011 or 2012, people started to talk about this disease in, in public. And now it's on the news and it's talked about, about this epidemic that's sweeping this country. And it's a major epidemic and we're losing an entire generation uh, of young people and others from addiction to prescription medication. That is another subject that we should talk about at some point in time. But we decided, you know, let's see what we can do for prevention. And so I met with the head of addiction medicine at Cedar sinai Dr. Jeff Wilkins. And I said, is there anything that keeps people off drugs? And he said, yes. We have found that rewards work. Rewards? Rewards. If you give a drug addict an alternative between using drugs and a substantial reward, they will not use drugs that day. So I said, well, what if we tried this with kids? What if we tried to give kids rewards for not using drugs? So I met with the Boys and Girls Club of America and found out something very interesting, that kids, once they became teenagers, leave the Boys and Girls Club of America. It's no longer cool. And I said, what if we had an incentive that we could keep kids there? And so we got vans, we closed down four blocks in East LA on Cincinnati Avenue in the heart of gangland. 900 families came. We had food trucks, Ferris wheels, and we pitched this idea that there's an epidemic and we can help your kids. If you and your kid will allow us to test them randomly with saliva for alcohol and drugs, we'll give them rewards. We'll give them educational opportunities. We'll take them to college campuses to see what college is like. We're going to make them eligible for college scholarships if they graduate as a sober high school student. That started about four and a half years ago. Right now we have about 5,000 kids in this program. We have six clubs in Los Angeles, one in Malibu, one in Long Beach, uh, one in East LA, uh, one in Monterey Park. The Los Angeles Dodgers just sponsored our club uh, wow. in, in East LA. Steve Tisch and the New York Giants uh, last summer we sponsored our team in the Bronx, our, our club in the Bronx. So there's kids in Bronx as well. This in is the not Bronx. just California, oh, no. it's SoCal. Yeah, this is in New York. We're opening a club uh, in Chicago at the uh, Jordan Boys and Girls Club that's going to be sponsored by the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago nice. White Sox. And just yesterday I got off the phone uh, with the president of the Oakland Raiders and they're sponsoring a club in Oakland. So we want to take this to every city that has a major sports franchise. The cost is minimal, the rewards are amazing. To date, we have not had one child fail a drug test in over four and a half years. You're kidding me. Not one. In four and a half years. Because the peer pressure now is how cool it is to not fall into the traps where they see what is happening to people in their own families and certainly in their own classrooms. And so that's what we're doing. It's called Brent's Club. Look What's up and see what we're doing at the brentshapiro.org. Brentshapiro.org. First of all, it's a story like that. The last thing a parent ever wants to experience is, is something like that. I've, I've spoken to a few parents who have had experience something like that. They tell me, Pat, just there's nothing more painful than this. So 
sorry for your loss, but uh, on the other Thank hand, you. the fact that you and your friend, I think you said Michael King, that you decided to do that and has turned into something like this, the man upstairs sometimes does some strange things to us that lead into something that's even bigger than that that we don't even know about because one story like Brent can end up influencing thousands of other kids that secretly struggle with the challenges of drugs that they're so embarrassed to talk about with their parents. We're dealing with some right now with very, very close relative of ours that we had to fly into a city and state to take them in and it's exactly what you said. It's that part of while you're on it, well finally I told my uh, family, I said you just got to go address it immediately and you got to go surprise the house and she did. And when the surprise happened, it was exactly what we expected. So the accountability of that, it's a lot of work. So appreciate you for doing that with the uh, well, thank you. foundation. And uh, more importantly, you know, like I said earlier, Class Act, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and allowing us to come here to your office and spending some time with you. Uh, I really enjoyed this time with you, Robert, truly. So did I, Patrick. Truly. I mean, you're, you're inspirational uh, and uh, you, you bring out a lot of things that I don't talk about. And uh, thank you for doing that. Thank, thank you for sharing that with the rest of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.